Okay, let's start. Welcome to this um, second section of the panel, Approaching Climate Change Adaptation Challenges, Knowledge and Practices. Welcome back uh, to the ones who already participated in, um, in the first panel and welcome to all uh, new participants. Um, together with Michaela Fenske, Silja Klepp, Dominika Farinella and Annika um, Pesemann, I have uh, organized um, this panel um, and uh, we will work uh, as follows. We will give a short wrap up uh, of the last section, which was a very fruitful, uh, interesting section with a fruitful, thought provoking discussion also. Um, so we give first a short wrap up. And then we have six short paper presentations of seven minutes. Um, we will have uh, time for questions after three papers, then again time for questions after three papers. And at the end of the panel, we will have uh, time for a general uh, discussion. Um, This um, session will be recorded, and if you uh, do not uh, want to be recorded, please put it in the chat uh, so that we can delete um, the recording uh, after. Okay, I think these were all the organizational things I, I had to say, and I would now give the screen to Michaela Fenske, who will start with the wrap-up of the last um, session. Yeah, thank you, Sophie. First of all, thank you so much for these wonderful contributions from different disciplines, from different regions, with different topics, but all dealing with aspects of climate change adaptation. When we had our discussion during the break, we discovered that a lot of you were very much interested in the question of what is the agenda the role, the responsibility of the anthropologies, not only um, in face of um, climate change and the needs of our societies, but also within the social fields of our disciplines and um, in collaboration with other disciplines. What can we contribute? What is our duty? Is it a question of boundary work, which is still needed? Or do we have to change also our agenda as researchers? What are the possibilities now? And maybe aren't we as anthropologists also um, very, very, um, very, um, very important contributors to build bridges between different disciplines, between different social milieus. So what should be our agenda? What can we do? And uh, we had these different wonderful case studies and presentations from you. And um, some of you, for example, showed us that repoliticizing um, climate change adaptation projects and climate change settings is one a very important uh, possibility and duty of anthropology um, with our critical analysis. So a core possibility, so to say, of our disciplines. Um, then we have also heard a lot uh, about uh, the possibilities of our reflexive knowledge practices we, we, we assumed. So um, help also so to say not only the other disciplines, but also uh, the different settings to be more reflexive on their own practices and knowledges. And um, of course, we've heard also quite a lot on maybe a more classical uh, approach of anthropology to be a translator and to connect different knowledge rearms and different scales also um, to each other. So the bridge building also a little bit that Michaela referred to. Okay, I, I guess that, yeah, you've said already a lot of things. Um, <laughs> but one one point I, I would maybe like to add is that our methods and are particularly and approaches are particularly appropriate to like decolonize and and depoliticize and denaturalize the uh, discourse on climate change adaptations. And I think that's what uh, the the case studies you've presented in the first um, session showed so beautifully and most impressively. 
Dominica, do you have an addition? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all uh, for the presentation. My comments uh, are, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, link to the things that uh, Tia told before. Uh, the, on the role of uh, anthropologists and the social researcher generally, because I'm a sociologist, and the idea is uh, don't uh, reduce this role to a faci process facilitate, facilitator or an intermediary, but uh, pay attention also to the role of uh, social researcher in mobilizing the community for change. Uh, first. Second, uh, I want uh, also for the final discussion to play uh, that uh, we try to play more attention to the complex role of the expert in, uh, in uh, creating, also because the expert has a, a big role in power relationship. And uh, finally, the last, po last point is uh, the need to avoid an opposition between scientific and popular knowledge because in local practice, they are often mixed. So in this sense, uh, for example, in my opinion, the cases of fish, uh, uh, fishmen show this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wrap up. Um, and then we immediately come to the to the first presentation. It's from Daniel Barbay from the Research Center for the Humanities Institute of Ethnology in Budapest, Hungary. And Bab uh, Daniel, I do not know if your co-presenters also there, uh, Zolt Molna um, from the Center of Ecological Research of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope that you can see my uh, presentation. Yes, we can. So uh, my name is Daniel Babay and I'm a biologist. And uh, I started to work in the Eastern Carpathians uh, 15, for 15 years. And our second author, Bela Janu, is a local farmer. So we discussed a lot in the last 15 years with him about uh, extensive grassland management, which is still living and functioning in this landscape. And now I would like to present the, the results of these discussions. First of all, I would like to speak about uh, drivers. We used... Um, so we used a framework developed by the Intergovernmental Policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, IPBS, which distinguished uh, direct drivers, which directly affect different elements of the ecosystem, like climate change, land use change, and direct exploitation, and indirect drivers, uh, which affect usually direct drivers, and through these drivers, the different elements of the ecosystem. The study area is in the Eastern Carpathians in Romania, a Hungarian community. This is a typical cultural landscape. Uh, the settlement is in the valley floor and uh, local farmer distinguished two important uh, type of hay meadows. Inner hay meadows, which are around the village and between the houses on the valley floor and uh, outer hay meadows, which are the mountain grasslands, which are really species rich semi-natural grasslands of European significance in terms of nature conservation. Some words about the development of techniques regarding the mowing and haymaking. So, of course, about 15 years ago, it was a typical area with the hand mowing by skite uh, because of the very steep slopes and the financial uh, opportunities of the local farmers. It was a social event as well. So the communal community organized the haymaking events were very important. Later, especially from the uh, uh, 2000, single axle motorized movers spread in the landscape. And nowadays, because of the out-migration of the younger generations, uh, local farmers could improve mechanization of the small scale uh, farms and imported very old uh, agricultural machines, especially from the Alps, from Switzerland and Austria, especially. 
Considering the factors which affect this extensive grassland management system now, I would like to concentrate only on the time of haymaking, which is a very simple decision. But if we consider all the factors which influence this decision-making process, we can consider uh, not only the political, but uh, the social, cultural, and ecological aspects as well of this social ecological system. Uh, gray arrows indicate all the factors which delay the time of haymaking, and black arrows uh, indicate all the factors which advance the time of haymaking. Climate change is one of the most important driver because uh, based on the perception of the local farmers, the increasing average temperature in the summer and the increasing frequency of extremely hot days, especially in May and June, can accelerate the ripening of the hay of the vegetation. Furthermore, the increasing impredictability of the precipitation pattern and the earlier start of the spring accelerate this process as well. On the other side, agricultural practices changed a lot. People abandoned springtime grazing on the inner hay meadows, for example. Uh, it was a common practice earlier that local farmers grazed the inner hay meadows from the middle of March till the middle of May, uh, which delayed the ripening of the vegetation. But nowadays they abandoned it because they started to manure the grasslands. After the abandonment of cereal cultivation, much more manure were available for the grassland manuring, which accelerated the ripening of the vegetation and advanced the time of haymaking. As a consequence, nowadays we can say the longer stems of the grass species on the hay meadows, and because of the increasing frequency of heavy rainfall events as a sign of the climate change in this region, which can flatten the, the hay, uh, people started to cut the hay earlier. Nowadays, the only one factor which can delay uh, the time of haymaking is the common agricultural policy system of the European Union and the subsidy system. But the problem is that the regulation is very rigid and inflexible. So, for example, in this landscape, 1st of July is the starting date of the haymaking. So if people would like to get the subsidies, it is forbidden to cut the hay before 1st of July. But because of the climate change and other agricultural changes, so all these factors which I presented, this is a big conflict in the local agricultural system. People have to balance between the subsidy system and the quality and the quantity of the hay. If we consider these changes in the last seven decades, we can distinguish three very typical uh, time periods in Central and Eastern European context. After the Second World War, we can see uh, the, the drivers on the uh, right side and the compromises and trade-offs on the uh, left side on this figure. These trade-offs are not so important in this case, but the most important message of, the, of this figure is that local farmers have to balance between much more, more and more drivers and trade-offs regarding this simple uh, land use uh, decision especially time of hay making. So the, com the situation is more and more complex and local farmer in more have to adapt to the regulations regarding nature conservation, other governmental uh, decisions, out migration, climate change, and uh, increasing mechanization. So it is not so easy nowadays. And one of the most important and severe uh, consequence of these changes is the gradual disappearance of this collaborative communal haymaking uh, institute called Kalaka in this region, which is an informal social institution, but important regarding the social capital of the local farms. And because of the very inflexible top-down political regulations, for example, the subsidy system, which I mentioned, and with the rigid deadline, which is 1st of July in this region, and the climate change and the related biological changes with, which accelerated the ripening of the vegetation. And thanks to the increasing mechanization, people have to start uh, hay making after 1st of July alone. So there is no possibility to organize uh, communal and collaborative hay making because uh, uh, considering the quality and the quantity of the hay and the livestock well-being, Everybody has to start to cut the hay alone. And uh, 
this very important and, and severe changes in this region because uh, the vulnerability of the local farms uh, increased uh, with the dis disappearing social capital. So I think that regarding the future of this social ecological system, it is very important to change, especially the top-down regulations, because of course climate change and the consequences of the biological changes. Uh, so we cannot manage uh, these, these changes, but top-down political regulations uh, there is a space here to, to help uh, to survive this local community. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel. And for this uh, really very interesting case study, I'm looking forward uh, to the question and discussion round. Um, and I would like to introduce the second speaker. Um, it is Sana Lilboenda and Anala, I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly, from the Abo Academy University in Turku in Finland. Are you there? Yes, thank you. Yes. I will start to share my screen. Okay, hope you see it. Yes, we can see, thank you. Yes, so hi, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for all the interesting presentations so far. In our panel, I've uh, enjoyed them a lot. So my name is Sanna and I just started uh, doing research within a project called Humans and Ticks in the Anthropocene, where um, ethnologists and historians study ticks in cultural and uh, historical settings of different kind. And in my presentation today, I will talk very shortly, obviously, about the relation between ticks, humans, and companion animals. So first, um, let's zoom in shortly on ticks in Finland. There are about 1,500 different species of ticks in Finland. Most of them live along the coast, in the archipelago, and in the lake areas. And only two of these species are dangerous from a health point of view for both humans and for companion animals, as they can infect us with the Borreliosis or TBE, which is thick-borne encephalitis. And places where there is a high risk of infection uh, with Borreliosis is marked here on the map with blue dots and the TBE with uh, the red dots. The general attitude against ticks is um, very problematic and ticks are stigmatized in the public discourse. Uh, they also raise a lot of emotions, like in this quote uh, from an online discussion. What could sound more dramatic than the ticks have ruined the country? Or to read about these kinds of experiences where the person is historically, historically afraid of ticks and even the thought of ticks and how these emotions have a profound impact uh, on her life, but also on her life, uh, life of her dog uh, when their everyday practices circle around ticks uh, during the tick season especially. What these experiences uh, lead up to is uh, avoidance and alienation uh, because of the increasing number of tick-related diseases each year. Uh, the development is seen as part of uh, climate change. Ticks are also uh, experienced and debated um, in the public discourse as a risk and considered dangerous uh, for the well-being of humans and companion animals, also without uh, even any actual encounters with the ticks. And also in scientific studies, ticks are often portrayed as high-risk species. The interesting thing is that um, the risk discourses are projected against nature and ticks as part of nature not against humans and their ways of exploiting 
the nature. To deal with ticks, um, protective measures are taken into use, such as collars, spot arms, etc., for companion animals to prevent ticks or to, to kill these ticks. That's the photo on the left. Also, a lot of non-pharmaceutical products are used and there is also a big market for different kinds of tools for removing ticks with. The picture on the right is from an ad campaign that some veterinary clinics use during spring um, to raise awareness of protecting animals, but also yourself uh, by not going out on a walk with unfamiliar uh, strange animals. And they succeeded because this photoshopped image of a hundred times enlarged tick certainly draws attention and uh, makes you think. Another form of practice is the practice of control to do uh, body checks regularly, uh, evenings and mornings on both your animals and yourself and to conduct a so-called tick season lifestyle. That means, for example, no dogs in the bed during night, etc. Uh, to conclude, it seems that the cultivated, the controlled nature um, is more tick proof, so to say, more secure, whereas the uncultivated, the uncontrolled nature bears a risk. And the tick season that starts uh, in the springtime and is going on until late autumn brings about tick-related practices of avoidance, adaptation, and also protection and control. And the discourses are colored strongly by anthropocentrism. One of these examples is that companion animals are protected against ticks to in fact protect humans from the ticks. I made it really short. I don't know if I used all seven minutes, but um, I want to thank you. Please visit our websites for more information about our project, or you can also email me. Thanks. Thank you, Sana. Thank you very much for this interesting case study. And please, to all of you, just note your, your questions. We will come to the questions in the next, uh, after the next presentation. So um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my, to my colleague, uh, Rebecca Ibanez uh, Martin. Uh, she is a researcher at the Mertens Institute in Amsterdam. And her topic is um, involving vulnerabilities, experimental wastewater systems in a damaged planet. Rebecca, the screen is yours. Hi, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, we cannot see you at the moment. Yeah, let me just uh, try to, yes, hi. So I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for putting together this wonderful panel. Thank you, Sophie, so nice to see you. We work together, but we don't see each other these days. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't have a PowerPoint for you, so you have to bear with my presence and, um, Sophie, please, could you let me know when my time is up? So, um, so what I want to discuss uh, today with you, it's I've been thinking about the concept of uh, vulnerability uh, lately based on my fieldwork uh, that I've been doing um, in a village that has implemented a new sanitation system to treat uh, wastewater in a different way. Uh, using microalgae to try to clean wastewater uh, better. So I've been thinking um, about the concept of vulnerability in part based on my ethnographic observations and also based on um, this current state of ecosystem and climate vulnerability that is fostering a lot of uh, actions to try to at least remediate or tackle uh, this current situation of, of crisis. 
So I am very interested in this concept of vulnerability, firstly, because it was indicated in my fieldwork, and secondly, because it radically opposed to a concept that probably many of us remember, the concept of resilience, that was very much used in anthropology in the past decades. I remember resilience being used a lot in healthcare, body practices, environmental systems, as a good thing or like a positive thing to acquire resilience. But now I've been confronted by the fact that actually vulnerability can teach us something about our current state of things, not only because, uh, of course, we are all going through a pandemic right now that has uh, basically, where most of us have been confronted with the fact that we are definitely much more vulnerable than perhaps many of us thought. Um, uh, so yeah, I am I am going to share with you how I've been thinking about this concept of vulnerability in, in my fieldwork. So firstly, I did fieldwork uh, for a couple of years in this community. It's a group of citizens that moved to a vacant uh, plot of land in the south of the Netherlands that uh, the, the municipality gave them. And there they started to build their houses and because they were very, very, very worried and very, very invested in, in moving to a more sustainable uh, future, they decided not to connect with the traditional centralized sewage. And instead, they teamed up with a group of scientists, uh, environmental scientists and ecologists working also in the Netherlands to build a new prototype to clean their wastewater using microalgae. And in a way, I connect with Sophie Boni from the previous section because this was a truly uh, interdisciplinary project in which I was an anthropologist uh, working together with the environmental scientists and the engineers uh, in trying to make a good technology for the citizens, for the citizens that were going to use um, uh, the technology. So I was with them from the moment of the design of the technology, but also in the moment of the implementation and also in the moment of use to see how the design was going, who needed to adapt, etc. And during my time doing that anthropological work, I found out that uh, vulnerability was a crucial question present in three different practices. So in one practice, the first practice was uh, in the technological infrastructure, so in the design of the pilot. The second, uh, in the vulnerability of the ecosystems uh, that this pilot uh, wanted to serve. And thirdly, the vulnerability of the social, the vulnerability of the community that I was working with. So I will very briefly touch upon these three um, uh, moments in which uh, vulnerability came about in my fieldwork. So first with the technology. So of course, the technology that um, the, the scientists were implemented in this were implementing in this uh, village. It's it wasn't a proof technology. It was an experimental system. Uh, therefore, it needed a lot of care, a lot of observation, a lot of repair, and a lot of tinkering. So that care for the technology, I thought it was exceptional because it required really a lot of work. And it also caused a lot of tensions among um, the citizens and among the scientists. And I was really all the time thinking, wow, that's a lot of work because we have technologies that are proven technologies, centralized systems. So why would you care? Why would you go to go? Well, why would you like to go into all this trouble? And um, I realized that the vulnerability of the technology was a practical question to act upon. And it was not seen as a bad thing per se, as a normative bad thing, but as something to learn from and to acquire uh, knowledge. So the vulnerability of the technology was never uh, thought of as um, uh, negative. So that was a, a very interesting finding for me um, that um, I wanted to point out uh, now very briefly. So the second vulnerability, uh, it, had to do, it, ha it had to do with uh, the question of toxicity and vulnerability of uh, our environmental. And the way uh, our environment, and the, the way that that vulnerability was played out was with the question of the new 
pol pollutants. Um, probably you are all aware of, of, of uh, pollutants of emerging concern, also known as forever chemicals. And those pollutants really challenge uh, traditional approaches in toxicology and in waste management uh, to uh, contaminants. Because um, in toxicology, uh, traditionally, um, the way to approach uh, toxicants is um, about the dose. So if you have uh, uh, small doses, then you keep toxicity away. That is not the case with these new contaminants. And the way that waste management approaches uh, toxicity is with an idea of management. Okay, we have toxicity, we have to manage. We have waste, we have to make it into a resource and make new materials out of it. So it's like a very managerial way. But the way that my interlocutors were approaching uh, toxicity was not as something that it's easy uh, manageable, but as something that always lingers, that it always stays with us. So then it's not a question of how to manage it, but it's a question of how we tackle that um, uh, toxicity in our vulnerable planet. So it's a question of distributing or it's a question to talking about risk, etc. And I have one minute left. Thank you, Sophie. So the, the third uh, vulnerability that I, um, that I uh, encountered in my fieldwork was a very mundane vulnerability. And it was the, the vulnerability of the social or the community building. So this new technology required a lot of care. They, it required a lot of attention. So if, for instance, uh, one of the people in charge of taking care of fixing some part of technology was to go away, to move to another uh, place, to take a new job, that really caused a lot of trouble because uh, they were losing all this know-how. So um, uh, this, this new kind of environmental concerns uh, made, um, it, it showed very strongly how uh, a good social cohesion and uh, it's, it's so important for these new technologies to, to survive. But what was very um, intriguing to me is that uh, it was never portrayed as something bad per se, this vulnerability, but as something to work with. So they were never really aspiring to have something sturdy or really like made into stone, but they were really willing to try to learn and work and live with this damaged planet. So this is what I found very interesting um, conceptually and anthropologically and uh, to think through together with you. So thank you so much. I give the floor now to Sophie. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for this really uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank you. And I think these three papers really fit together very well because they all address vulnerability uh, in a way. Um, so um, I would now like to start um, the round of questions and uh, discussion. You can just raise your hand if you want to. I totally forgot Michaela, you are my co-moderator. Thank you very much for being there and helping me with this moderation. Uh, you can just raise your hand or you can put your, um, your question in the chat. Questions to Daniel, Sana and Rebecca. Thank you very much for all these three great presentations. Um, I have a question to Daniel. I found it very intriguing that the EU policies messed up the whole system, so to say, through their rigidity and that uh, the small scale farmers could not do the hay anymore when it is appropriate, but only um, after the 1st of July, as you said. So my, my question would be, did they organize somehow against these policies? Uh, did they try to form alliances or what, what actually happened? Thank you for your question. So this is the most important income for the local farmers in this landscape. So that's why they, um, they try to follow the regulations and uh, they don't want to break these rules. But uh, we try to use our results and try to help these uh, communities somehow. So, for example, we started to work on the 
result-oriented uh, approaches because uh, some, so for example, in Germany or in Switzerland, you can find uh, another approach in the subsidy systems where the regulations are not so rigid and more flexible. The most important are the indicator species which can present these uh, species, species rich ecosystems. And uh, local farmers can follow the traditional way of farming and, and keep these indicator species. And this is much more favored by local farmers because uh, nobody tried to teach them how to do the farming, but uh, only the results are important. And uh, we hope that uh, we can initiate to, to elaborate this system in this region as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have first a question from Maria Matelli and then Sofia Boni. Maria writes in the chat, thanks everyone again. I have a question that ties into the topic of vulnerability as a condition for being alive, humans and non-humans. And the question is especially for Zana. Do you have ideas on how to nurture better relations with non-humans, both dogs and ticks? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, yes, I've been I've been thinking about this uh, a lot because um, it seems that the relation is really problematic from a, from a human point of view. Um, I would love to know what the the dogs or the cats think about this or what the ticks uh, think about it. But but um, I think the, the profound uh, thought in this would be that we just, uh, there's sometimes um, discourses or, or not even sometimes all the time that um, the ticks have increased in such an amount uh, because of the climate change that that we can no longer handle them. But this is not really true when you look at the statistics about how many ticks uh, live in Finland or, or maybe in Europe. Um, it's just that um, we are more aware of them and, and also of the, all the sicknesses that they might infect us with. And this makes us so much more cautious about them Uh, instead of trying to live with them. This is the same discourse that's been going on for centuries here with the wolves, that uh, they should not exist anywhere near uh, human habitation. And every time a wolf is seen somewhere near uh, human habitation, it's such a big risk. And of course, we are dealing with totally different kind of species, um, but still ticks are considered the most dangerous animals in the Finnish nature because we can't coexist. We don't have the capacity to, to think that they are a part of nature. And only two of these species within the tick population are dangerous. And all these 1,400 98 are not, but still we labelize all of them as being dangerous. So we need to find um, a way to, to accept this and uh, in that sense also nurture our relationship with both our companion animals and uh, with the ticks. Thank you. Sophia. Are you still with us? We cannot see you. Hi, yes, I'm very sorry. Uh, house, <laughs> house issue to, to deal with. Uh, um, yes, I have a question uh, to Rebecca about vulnerability. Um, so I was, uh, I mean, I think it's such a loaded concept and it's just so promising, but at the same time, so difficult to deal with. And I really enjoyed how you unpacked it a bit into different kinds of vulnerabilities that actually are really connected, right? And that we always have to think about different kinds of vulnerabilities, not only of people, but also of ecosystems, as you said, or infrastructures. Mm, well, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about 
how you worked with that concept in the field. So whether your other research, other researchers you collaborated with or research participants used it as well, for instance, or is this something that people raise as an issue themselves or is it something that sort of comes later on uh, when we try to problematize it in such a way? Thanks, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, it didn't, so, um... So this was a collaboration between a lot of different partners. Uh, so this was like ecologists, environmental scientists, anthropologists, lay people, as, as we tend to call them. And um, so what was very interesting to me was the, 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 the practices in which vulnerability came to matter were so different, but they were we were all enmeshed in this very vulnerable state, either in regards to a technology that didn't work, or either as citizens preoccupied with rivers that are being very vulnerable to waste discharges, etc. So um, uh, what I want to say is that um, usually, and probably the uh, our colleague who uh, speak about hey knows more about this, but in in ecosystem services. Usually, uh, they tend to talk about fragility, and correct me if I am wrong, about fragility of the ecosystem services. And to me, this points out to an idea that if you are fragile, is because you can be sturdy. So you have to protect that break, that rupture. So fragile is not fragile, kind of like gets into this dichotomy of... Um, N not to break, please do not break. But vulnerability, it's a way of living with the vulnerability. So it's not preventing to be vulnerable, but to learn to live with your vulnerabilities and care for those. So for me, fragility kind of tends to, to, to work towards an state in which that fragility doesn't exist anymore. But vulnerability tries to understand that there is no escape from the vulnerability and then you have to learn how to live with that in the most in the best possible way and in my risk in our group this is what it fascinated me that environmental scientists they were really aware that their um, technology will never be perfect they will always be something that will never work quite well and that you have to tinker with it and there was like this care. So they were really trying to care for the technology, but they were not really interested in making this technology like um, uh, sturdy and transportable. They were trying to really adapt the technology from to that particular context. So that was what so interesting to me about this concept of vulnerability. And I know that a colleague of mine, the UVA, just published a book about vulnerability in Bergen, and it's more about the, the vulnerable bodies, like the, the racialized body as vulnerable or the transgender body as vulnerable. So I know that there is a lot of work in anthropology of vulnerability, but I was more interested in this idea of like STS and, and, and social science of science um, and, and ecosystem services to work with this idea of vulnerability as something that is not bad per se. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. We have one last question. Um, it's a short one and Daniel, please answer it also uh, shortly. Um, the question com comes from Domenica. The new CAP supports agricultural uh, multifunctionality. Can this be a support for extensive and traditional grassland? Daniel, are you there? No, maybe he, we have lost him. So then we go to the next session, I would, uh, the next presentation, I would say. Um, this is the presentation from Tahira Mohamed. Um, and it is, uh, Tahira is working as a researcher at the University of Sussex and her paper is called Role of the Moral Economy and Everyday Practices in Responding to Uncertain Drought in Northern Kenya. 
the floor is yours. And we already see your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful panel. Sorry, I had technological hitches, uh, but now I hope my presentation is visible and I'm also audible. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on this project uh, called Pastoralism, Resilience and Uncertainty, which aims to look at, at the people at the margin, the vulnerable communities, indi indigenous communities, on how they live with different forms of uncertainties, such as climate change, diseases, as well as migration policies. So this project is, what is looking at the, how pastoralists in particular are living with these forms of uncertainties in different regions of the world, uh, in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, as well as in, in Central Africa. Uh, in this project, I'm particularly looking at the lens of the moral economy on how pastoralists live with these uncertainties by relying on different forms of solidarities, uh, collective redistribution to be able to survive the, 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 the uncertainties they live with. So uh, I, I looked at this uh, moral economy through ethnographic work which was conducted in the 1975 in this region that I'm studying, which is in the northern Kenya. Uh, the ethnography is about uh, the livelihood of this pastoral community, which was studied by one uh, ethnographer called Gurdun Dahal. She authored the book on the screen, Suffering Grass, and the book was authored in the 1975. At the end of the book, she said, will there still be resilience in the suffering grass? I would hope so, but can see no clear answer. In this book, uh, she's referring to how these pastoral communities are suffering because of post-colonial war, the adverse climatic condition, and also how they are being displaced by the national government. So she was assuming the, the suffering grass as the pastoral system, which was undergoing those changes, and she was wondering whether these people, they will be resilient. So I took her work as a baseline study, and I'm assessing how the livelihood, the uncertainty, uncertainties have been changing for them and how they are living all this period by asking this key question, uh, what is the role of the moral economy in response to uncertainty and how it has been changing since 1975? I don't know why I can't go to the next slide. Yeah. So <clears throat> to this end, I'll take you to the context of the study area which is in the Northern Kenya, uh, area marked with red on the map. This is a pastoral region. It's a very dry and semi-arid area. Uh, it, is, it is bordered by different pastoral communities around the seven borders which surround this area. Uh, and these communities usually compete for a very strategic resource in the region, which is this river called Waso River. And this competition leads to a lot of ethnic conflict and resource-based conflict. And you see people usually hard their livestock with guns. So it is very insecure. Again, um, the land use is also shared with the wild animals. There are a lot of conservancies, uh, wild animal reservations. So pastoralists have to deal with wild animals. The, the conflict between human wild animal is also very common here. Again, uh, the aspect of drought and very arid climatic region, the region receives about less than 300 millimeter of rain annually. So they live also with a very erratic drought. So this makes the study area a very important context of studying uncertainty. And also animal disease is very common because sometimes because, uh, due to this adverse climatic condition, there is increased uh, risk of flooding, which results into animal disease and also uh, human disease. So these people live with a very uh, integrated forms of uncertainties. Um, Okay, so having described this context of the people who are um, researching, I want to bring to your understanding to this concept of moral economy, which was coined back in the 18th centuries by E.P. Thompson, who argued that um, the, the English crowd were rioting because they wanted a just price. They wanted a just price for the bread. So people were using the analogy of moral economy to bring morality in their just price. So people wanted the government and like those people who are providing the bread to give justice in, in their provision. Again, it was used by the uh, study of the peasant by James Scott, where he was arguing that the peasants were using the, the, 
the first principle of ethics of ensuring subsistence for everybody as a moral economy analogy. So they are saying everyone should have subsistence for the production to continue. So it's a, a concept whereby people use to demand justice, to demand subsistence and equality. So uh, in, a, in addition, this concept is also used in Islam uh, in an institution known as Zakat. And in this institution, wealth is, is distributed from the wealthy people to the poor people and enhance social security. That means like the wealth is not just concentrated on the wealthy hands, but it's also distributed to the poor and the needy. So having understood the concept in a wider form, what does moral economy mean in pastoral context? In pastoralism, moral economy is about exchange and distribution. It's about networking and it's about insurance. And many studies are arguing that this concept is diminishing, it is eroding, or it's being replaced by a capitalistic economy because pastoralists are now market-based, they're taking their product in the market. But then I argue that moral economy is not just exchange, it's about collective solidarity, it's about networking, it's about, it's about acting together for a beautiful future. So I'll, uh, in this context, I, I, I again add that pastoralists use the concept of moral economy not just to market and for future insurance, but also to survive all the calamities that they live with. To this end, I define moral economy as normative forms of collective, redistributive, and everyday best practices that help people survive. So it's not just about redistribution, it's every day. As shown in these pictures on the slide, there is one where a bull fall, fall in, in the well, and people are trying to pull it together. You are not paid to do this work. You are working because you want to protect your brother. You want to make sure that your fellow pastoralist is surviving. And in the middle picture, you, you find people helping uh, feed the, the calf. So it's not about just helping for, for getting something, but it's, it's make sure that it's helping to make sure that your brother survives this erratic condition. It's to make sure that everyone else is surviving. And that survival is about collectivity, it's about selflessness, which is a very important aspect that pastoralists depict and they live with this concept to enhance their resiliency through time. Uh, for this study, I, uh, I started my fieldwork in 2019, September, and uh, continued until 2020. And uh, the method, the, the, the study period is divided into three phases. Phase one was documentary analysis because it's a longitudinal research. I am tracing changes since 1975 to 2020, which is about 45 years. So trying to get the secondary information, what has happened in between. And also these people are nomadic people. They move from places to places. Uh, sampling is really critical. So second phase of the study, I spent sampling them and trying to get participatory mapping of the event which happened since this time. And finally, the third phase of the research, I was so much focused on empirical data collection through focused discussions, narrative, depth, in-depth interviews and participatory events. And then I found that moral economy is about three things. It's not just about distribution. It's not just about collective activity. It's about responding to crisis together. Like, for example, we can link this to the concept of coronavirus, which just came to the world. It's a crisis. And it should only be dealt with when collectivity in, in, is enhanced. The aspect of companionship, the aspect of brotherhood, which is always visible in these people's livelihood. So moral economy is about being able to respond to crisis together in a companion way. And also it's about redistribution because if we collectively respond to crisis, we also need to help each other because these people, whenever they lose livestock to drought, to raiding, they actually exchange livestock. There are very many institutions of livestock exchanges in this among this community. So this aspect of distributing to your neighbor, showing solidarity is a very common concept within this pastoral community, which helps them survive. And finally, moral economy is about collective conservation for future consumption here. Here, like the pastoralists, since they live in a very erratic, very vulnerable condition, they usually conserve their environment in a very specialized way. Number one, they divide their, their, their nature, uh, their ecological nature into seasons, the dry season grazing, the wet season grazing. And these institutions are followed very keenly because people want to, to make sure that they have food for the future, they have food for the animals, and they have enough land to graze their animals. So it's about collectively understanding and negotiating how to survive this erratic condition. Hira, so, you have uh, one, one minute left. Yeah, I one end by uh, 
I end by making, uh, I end by concluding that uh, moral economy brings people together. It is considering that this world, this nature is ours and we all have responsibility to take care of it because it belongs to us. As my community, the community that I studied, they say livestock is ours, so we all have to protect. And as shown by the pictures, when it falls in the well, it is the responsibility for us all to wake up and pull that together. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And if you want to follow us and our, pro our project, uh, you can go to the website and join our newsletter. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Taira. Thank you. Wonderful. We will come back to this, I'm sure, in the in the round of questions and during the discussion. So um, let me introduce the next speaker. Um, Tahira, I don't know, um, you might uh, exit. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so the next speaker is Arno Pascht uh, from the Freie uh, Universität in uh, Berlin. And his paper has the title Adaptation to Climate Change in Vanatu from Knowledge to Communication. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, many climate change adaptation programs in Vanuatu aim to secure livelihood in rural areas of the country. Uh, when we talked about possibilities to assure one's livelihood, one of my research partners in the village of Sibiri in the island state of Vanuatu in Oceania explained, you have to do different things. You cannot do, just do one thing or stay at home. Men Vanuatu has to move. This presentation is based on my research project, Localizing Global Climate Change Policies in Vanuatu, Reception of Knowledge and Sociocultural Transformations, funded by the DFG. I will sketch out one of the results of the research project. The participants of adaptation projects focusing on agriculture did not follow the methods shown there in a linear way. Furthermore, they chose additional activities in order to secure their livelihood. Thus, we ask the questions. Did the knowledge, tra knowledge transmission fail? Which ways of acting did people actually choose instead? Our findings show that first, people did remember the methods and techniques demonstrated in the adaptation projects very well. Second, people used well-established patterns of action during the drought shortly after some workshops of the adaptation project. And third, in some cases, people later implemented some of the methods and techniques they had experienced in the workshops of the adaptation project. Why is this important? When looking at processes of change and persistence of people's everyday practice in the context of climate change adaptation projects, it is not enough to consider knowledge transmission and the encounter of different knowledge systems, it is essential to focus on people's different ways of being in the world. Vanuatu is classified as a small island developing state and accordingly regarded as highly vulnerable to climate change. Hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, and so on, and a higher number of extreme weather events caused by climate change will mean additional stress for agriculture. Accordingly, inhabitants of rural areas in particular will have to deal with problems cultivating their crops. This is seen as a problem for national food security as most Vanuatu work in the agricultural sector and more than 80% live in rural areas and practice horticulture. A great number of climate change adaptation projects have been and are being carried out in the agriculture sector. The aim is to improve and support family farming in rural areas for subsistence and in the market. An important aim is to introduce new cultivation methods and techniques in order to adapt cultivation to recent and future impacts of climate change. During the time between 
2012 and 2019 in the village of Siviri on the main island of uh, Vanuatu, Ifate, one major adaptation project and a number of smaller projects and workshops have been realized by the agriculture department and various NGOs. Villagers were generally interested in the projects and attended the workshops. According to our interlocutors, they highly appreciated getting to know new methods for agriculture. Their view, this knowledge might indeed become relevant in the future. Some villagers then actually tried out some of the new methods. Uh, however, after showing enthusiasm in the first place, many participants did not continue or even not start to implement most of the new methods and techniques, much to the surprise of the project managers. They even did not use them after a period of drought in 2015, when they had already visited a number of workshops. This drought had followed a category five cyclone, which had occurred in 2015 and constituted a situation for which the new methods were intended. Instead, most people in Sibiri had shifted their focus away from horticulture to other options to make their living. We found that community members in Sibiri combined different livelihood possibilities already during the last decades. Established practices, innovative possibilities derived from diverse sources and practices of maintaining food security presented during the workshops and training sessions. The quotation I presented you at the beginning expresses that it is fundamental for people of Vanuatu not only to move between different places where they, for example, have planted different gardens, but also to engage in different activities and, different, and in different places. This means additionally to gardening, villagers found employment in the capital Port Vila or elsewhere on the island of Ifate. There is a great variety of different kinds of self-employment and wage labor being practiced. A new development in Sibiri was, for example, the increase of cutting firewood and uh, selling it at the market. One couple explained how they managed to combine different activities. While the husband followed up his work in town during the week, the wife worked in the gardens next to their house. In their spare time, they planted food crops in their gardens that are more distant. In the evenings, they opened their kava bar and um, sold their prepared food. There are numerous more examples of this kind of uh, strategies. People in Sibiri diversified their livelihood possibilities by combining various options simultaneously and over time. How they act, they decided and implemented in interaction with the broader environment, not only the soil, plants and animals, but for example, also the market, infrastructure and social relations. In these interactions, activities are creatively generated. Neither is what we may call livelihood and food security for the villages confined to cultivation of food plants, nor is climate change and climate change adaptation confined to the environment in a narrow, narrower sense regarded as nature. Climate change is an encompassing process which comprises what one could uh, categorize as social, cultural, economic, etc. Et spheres. Thus, turning the focus of climate change adaptation projects away from knowledge transmission could prevent misunderstandings. Alternatively, commun communication during adaptation projects has to include the recognition of and dialogue about fundamental ontological assumptions of the people about the world and connecting practices and, and the connected practices. The aim would be that the involved parties establish a new shared approach to problems in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this interesting uh, case. Um, we go now to the last speaker of today and then have our discussion and questions. Um, and the speaker is Adam Pisarek um, from the University of uh, Silesia in Katowice. 
and he will talk about a fragile equilibrium ecology of knowledges in the wetlands of eastern Poland. Are you there, Adam? I already Hi, saw I'm, you. Yes. Hi, I'm nice sure, to have I'm you. Not sure. Yeah, you have you can hear me, yes. Okay, so if you have success, then I'll try to share my short uh, provocation. Uh, I hope uh, you can see the slide now. Uh, yes. Okay, so thank you for opportunity to listen uh, all these interesting speeches and also uh, to show you uh, the research I'm developing. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, my first visit to the marshy area of the Narev National Park uh, was in 2010, and it was 14 years after the foundation of the Narev uh, National Park. Uh, it was then that I saw this astonishing uh, landscape, and it is one of uh, unique on an European scale. Uh, as a tourist, uh, I listened attentively to the story of the one of the local ferrymen, uh, for whom the river was not a place of miracle of wild nature, uh, but a home and a property. Uh, an older man uh, was pointing his finger at his family's meadows and recalled his childhood uh, when it was possible to fish freely in the summer and skate in the winter. Uh, it was all new to me uh, then. Uh, I live and work in the Silesian upland uh, in the largest Polish conurbation created around coal mines. Uh, no wonder that my perception of the wetland landscape at the time was based on a game of contrast between various landforms and environments. Uh, I returned to the Narev National Park in uh, 2020. This time, uh, the anthropological epistemic framework uh, formed my relationship with place and people. Uh, I wanted to trace the connections between situated ecology of knowledges and the local landscape change trajectories. Uh, I was led through the area by the memories uh, I had heard 10 years later. Over time, I gathered diverse stories about National Park uh, Turbulent Past. The stories that one of my interlocutors uh, summed up as follows. Uh, everything was there, uh, and in a moment, there will be nothing. Uh, in my project, I want to think with the inhabitants of the park buffer zone about what happened and what will happen there, uh, taking the above diagnosis seriously. Uh, concurrently, I realize that by creating a space for translation and partial connections, I am also beginning to influence the situation. My uh, Miha Rader introduced this category. Uh, I use it to connect with patterns of collective imagination and actions uh, that emerge from material discursive worlds. Uh, this framework allows me to ask about the effects of knowledge transfers uh, from environmental engineering, intensive agriculture and conservation on changing landscapes. Uh, I will tell you about everything and then about the journey toward nothing. Uh, I will also mention technoscientific methods of maintaining a fragile state of equilibrium uh, in a world full of tensions and precarious futures. Uh, the landscape of the Narev wetlands arose and changed in the multitudes of durations and rhythms. On a geological scale, the most important event was the, the retreat of central Polish glacier, uh, which formed a valley cut by terminal moraines. Pits uh, in the described area began to form about 3,000 years ago. Uh, they stabilized the multi-channel flow uh, of the river. As a result, boggy environment emerged and the spring floods created a frame uh, for the life processes. Mm. The present landscape and the biodiversity are a result of people's attunement with these rhythms. Uh, following generations of settlers strive to maintain fertile meadows in an inaccessible areas flooded every year. Thus, they were part of the natural cultural structures of long uh, duration. The emerging landscape uh, was primarily related to the cosmotechnics of gospodarowanie, uh, which until the middle of the 20th century uh, were the main points of reference for the situated technical forms of producing and performing knowledge about environmental processes. Uh, what is gospodarowanie? Uh, it is participation in shaping the landscape, a duty to the land and family uh, to secure life. Uh, it is also labor, mowing meadows, tilling a field, fishing, and consumption, understood as a moral attitude. Uh, Gospodarowanie is caring for and taking life in a sacred world where every gesture is ethical and at the same time practical. Uh, 
it was a world where life was deeply rooted in the entanglements of matter, action, and the values. Uh, each effort was morally significant and symbolic. It was treated as a part of a metaphysical whole and at the same time reduced to imminence. Uh, that was everything from the stories of my interlocutor. From the 1970s, an intensive transformation of the noosecape began. Agricultural advisors employed by the state transferred knowledge and tools for mechanization. Engineers in their calculation centers developed plans for drainage that turn wetlands into drying meadows. Activists and scientists presented their expertise on the values of the local nature. Hence, the various, uh, various forms of techno-scientific knowledge have begun to co-shape the landscape and modify the trajectories of its change. As a result, the land ceased to be a life-giving mother. It has become a means of production, a wasteland, and a nature that needs to be protected. Gospodarowanie turned it into intensive monocultural farming, subordinated to the laws of the market and EU programs. After some time, the national park was established and people working in it responded to the effects of modernization processes. Currently, they try to keep the autonomic nature in its past shape and influence the further transformation of the noosecape with the help of educational programs. The park staff activities help to maintain a fragile equilibrium through special separation, monitoring, and control of selected processes. Expositions, paths, maps, visualization uh, also help to establish nature as a discrete but dynamic entity. However, the awareness of people working in the park and those living nearby turns out to be closer to the post-natural ways of conceptualizing the world. They draw attention to various rhythms, intensities, and duration that may lead the park and its buffer zone towards many futures. Uh, it was one of those futures that my interlocutor described uh, when he said that there was everything and soon there will be nothing. This conclusion, based on his daily observation of landscape disintegration, a transformation of certain cosmotechnics and knowledge traditions, also translating the discussion about the climate crisis, crisis into local symptoms of change, uh, is for me a significant diagnosis about the disappearing situated worlds presented in terms of the ecology of becoming in precarious uh, times. Uh, thank you very much for your attention uh, and help to discuss. Uh, this question further. Thank you very much, Adam. Good. So now we have time for questions. It will be questions on the three last uh, papers from uh, Tahira Mohamed, from Arno Pasht, and from Adam Pirasek. And um, you can again just raise your hands. Maybe you can also put your camera on again so that we can see you. Um, and you can, of course, also uh, write your questions in the chat. Yes, thank you. I have a question for Tahira. Thank you very much for your um, nice contribution. I loved to hear about the concept of more economy and um, especially that you have started with, with Edward Thompson. Uh, that's um, very much interesting because most of the people using this concept forget um, the context um, in which it was developed and it was developed from Edward Thompson and others. What I was wondering when I was listening to your ideas was whether Eleanor Oeström's work about commons would also be a concept to work with your empirical study. Do you know Eleanor Oeström's work about commons? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really a very interesting concept in, in terms of common resource sharing, especially with the open rangelands and pastoralism. Yeah, yeah it's, it adds to the concept of collective reservation as well, which is really, really key. But then it also comes with the crisis of the common resource, right? the way there's conflicts and everything else. But yeah. then if, if the communities put their survival strategies first ahead of the, the crisis, if they are if they, they put their livelihood ahead of that crisis, then they can manage that. But also, 
it's a concept which we cannot ignore because the conflict comes from other people, other neighboring pastoralists, because the resources is common, it cuts across the boundaries. So it's, it's something which is really important to figure about. Thank you for bringing this up. Other questions? Or contributions, maybe you would just want to comment. Maybe you don't have a question. Celia. Sorry, me again. <laughs> I would love to hear more about um, Arno's work in Vanuatu. Actually, you said that it would be very good to have a, a deep, maybe a, a deep or communication at least uh, about the different ontologies that are involved um, in these climate change adaptation projects from the side of the facilitators of the projects and from the side of the people in Vanuatu. How could we initiate such a dialogue uh, in, a, in a good way? I think it might be quite a, a challenge. Yes, I agree with you. It uh, is uh, certainly a challenge. Um, I think it would be the first step that there is an awareness that there are different ontologies at work. And I think there must be a communication process where I don't think that there is a mutual understanding at the end, but uh, as I try to formulate it in the end of my uh, paper, it maybe it would work that um, together the different involved parties, they create a solution or a, maybe a new ontology um, where everyone could work with or uh, everyone is convinced of. So I think this is maybe the only possibility, but even to uh, come to the point to the awareness is, and I agree, I agree to you, uh, very difficult. Um, yeah, maybe it, um, my project is not really um, finished yet, so I hope I can, um, it, it is possible for me to talk with some of the um, staff of the NGOs, for example, of, at the agriculture um, department in Vanuatu and to try to initiate uh, such a communication process. But I think, I too, I think it's uh, difficult. Yeah, thank you for the question. Laura Otto has a question. Laura. Yeah, thank you. I think it's between a question and a comment that has been on my mind throughout the afternoon, but came back now when I listened to your talk, Arno. Yeah, so you, Zilia, you basically asked the same question. So how can we facilitate communication? How can we facilitate dialogue? And which role do we as anthropologists play in these processes? And then This reminded me of our conversation earlier, which roles do we have in reformulating policies and so on and so forth. And then I was wondering, in by initiating these dialogues, so what are the risks? Like who is left out again? Who is not invited? Who is not being heard? Um, yeah, and which role do we play in, in, in making decisions of whom we should listen to and whom we cannot see or cannot hear due to various reasons? So I think there are, there's a new conflict potential as well. So maybe, Arno, you have any experiences or thoughts about this? Uh, thank you. Um, I think I rather take it as a comment. Um, I, too, I do not have really good uh, ideas how to, as I said, uh, initiate. Maybe uh, um, next year uh, I can tell more. <laughs> um, after I've tried to uh, make maybe a workshop together with uh, the involved parties. Right. But yeah. Well, maybe we can just stay in touch because I face similar challenges. In my case, for example, um, people who live far away from the coast are also impacted by the coastal transitions, yet they are often not heard or being considered when the discourse is about climate change along the coast. So... <laughs> Well, I think anthropological knowledge and studies can contribute also to making visible these well interactions or entanglements, but still um, there are always conflicts we do not see, I think. But I, I would like to discuss this further. Yeah, yeah, good idea, yeah. 
Thank you. Good. Then we have a question or a comment in the chat, and it's from Marlies Haya. I wonder how in all three case studies, the voices of the people affected could have been included in a better way for before implementing concepts such as establishing a national park or offering workshops or capitalist logics. Maybe that's a, uh, as well our task as anthropologists. Would one of the, would the three speakers react on this maybe? Adam? Yeah, so maybe I, I can try. The situation with National Park is really difficult. And I think that there is another issue uh, for sure I should uh, concern. I'm not sure if it's uh, in every of the situations, but uh, the knowledge ecology I'm dealing with, it's not uh, a simple one with top-down relations and with only uh, one way of, I don't know, governing this uh, knowledge. I think that this transition from uh, the extensive uh, agriculture into the intensive one uh, was uh, really connected to the uh, different ways this territory was changed and then uh, tried to be protected as a some way you know of uh, of uh, even activism uh, and this activism uh, created then for example national parks so uh, there is uh, a really uh, hmm, a difficult form of this knowledge entanglement and also of these projects of protecting people or uh, or territory also there's a problem of multi-generational uh, uh, discussion because the older ones see the world as it was that it is disappearing uh, and the young ones uh, just try to create a new way of uh, dealing with nature with park and with uh, capitalist logics so uh, in my opinion it's not uh, only about uh, you know creating a, a way of understanding the local community but it's also uh, about understanding how uh, this knowledge traditions uh, uh, emerged in this landscape of something interconnected and uh, not so easy to disperse uh, and uh, be seen as a discrete entity. So in this way, uh, translating processes are, of course, uh, needed, uh, but uh, it is my problem uh, uh, where to put this translation device. It's not so uh, simple uh, from my perspective. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Tahira, uh, and I think that would be then the last contribution, and then we go to a general uh, discussion and con uh, and would also look at the first panel and have a more general discussion. Tahira. Yeah, thank you so much. I wanted to respond uh, on that question also about how we can use our case studies to advocate for the voices of the people we are studying. Um, like like for, for my case study, uh, this region, the government is bringing a lot of conservation entities. There's a lot of conservancies in the region. And generally, as a scholar activist, like we need to bring our work to the to the to the wider audience, for example, reaching out to the local media, translating our work, let's say just a blog post or a, or a short article, and making sure that all that information is reaching not only the 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 policymakers but also the people that we are studying, and through lobbying across different entities and policy influencers. Uh, there is this discussion going on for the International Year of Rangeland and Pastoralism. Uh, and then it was uh, subjected to the United Nations and it's already approved. So through such ent entities by lobbying, networking, and also establishing our network in terms of spreading the information will help us like, yeah, help these communities that we are studying. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, we, we turn now to the general discussion and Annika has prepared a slide. Annika, could you share it with us just as a kind of input uh, so that we can start a general discussion? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Just a second. And Annika's um, PowerPoint, the presentation will show the thematic fields we we saw in all those abstracts uh, we have read and in the um, in in the presentations we have heard today. Exactly, and here we go. I think I hope you can see it all. Yes. 
also the full screen. Yeah, okay. This is basically kind of a quick sum up of, of things that came up today or questions that came up today. And um, the first thing that was also so prominent in both sessions was, of course, designing research and the question, what is considered an adequate role of anthropology to address climate change and climate change adaptations, particularly in regard to um, other scientific disciplines, especially in the natural science, and also in regard to the public, the question of reflexivity of our own work as a kind of like, what is kind of boundary work within tr transdisciplinary research settings and our contribution to denaturalizing and politicizing the discourse on climate change adaptation. I think particularly in the later case studies, it became very clear the um, inequality um, that is reproduced also, of course, in often in climate change adaptation projects. Another uh, thematic field uh, closely related is kind of the nexus of, of power and knowledge. We have discussed already earlier the, the term of situated knowledge, um, but also the different forms of knowledge, the embodied tradi traditional local so-called indigenous or expert knowledge, the list can be go on for, for, for more words, and the hierarchies, of course, you know, the power relations, but also the concept of not, not knowing something, you know, like who's also maybe excluded from a um, um, certain type of, of knowledge. Um, and we, um, the, the conceptual work that uh, we heard in some um, talks, for instance, adaptation, vulnerability, knowledge, resilience. These are all uh, concepts that are very much in the discourse on climate change adaptation, but that need to be also, you know, questions or problematized. What does that actually mean, vulnerability, for instance, or knowledge, resilience? And um, Another important approach of like researching and conceptualizing what is actually nature in that entire um, concept in the more than human and the multi-species entanglements and climate change adaptations. What we've also seen, for instance, in, in, the, in the talks on the ticks, but also, of course, in, in the other, in other uh, presentations. And also establishing new or uh, alternative forms of collectivity facing climate um, change. So new um, social forms that uh, established within um, uh, attempts to 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 deal uh, with uncertainty, for instance. So th these are it's by far not complete, but just like some uh, thematic fields, questions, and challenges that came up within this um, two sessions. And I think that or that that might be very valuable uh, and um, to address in maybe also like future uh, projects. Um, because as you might remember, as Celia's talk from the beginning, it's, it's for us, it's also a very important uh, way, this, this panel, to, to think what is actually happening in, in, that, in the field, in what, I, what is anthropology uh, contributing anthropological studies, and how can we maybe work out uh, networks and, and maybe future projects. So these are just um, a few thematic fields, questions and challenges would be opened up um, that should invite more questions and maybe also like more thematic fields that you're, that you're missing from, from that list. So, that so maybe list. that could already be the first question. Yeah, um, exactly. Do you agree with this, with these uh, points? Would you add others? Which questions are important to ask and to bring in? Yeah. I get close that. That's okay. Yes. So we can see each Thank other. you so much, Annika. And so, who would like to start? Who would like to react? What were your experiences um, today? Okay. Katarina. Yes, thank you everyone for this very interesting panel and the nice talks. Um, it was really, really great. Um, well, I have so much on my mind, but maybe I just take up one point. Um, and I think it is about reflexivity. We have talked about it uh, so far only as a 
scientific reflexivity. But I would like to stress that uh, reflexivity exists in the field as well on all parts. And maybe our task can be um, to establish um, situations where reflexivity can happen. Uh, I think it was Laura who mentioned earlier that roundtables work uh, quite well. Um, I think those are parts where um, yeah, we can maybe steer the process or enable the process mm -hmm. without being forced to, um, to have a political stance beforehand. Um, because I think the openness and the not so neutral, maybe we don't see us as neutral, but as scientists, uh, or this is ex at least my experience, we are often seen as a neutral part. And this is, of course, a position that can um, bring people together because they don't fear us. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is what I think is very important. And to, uh, there's a lot of research about how to establish that in trans, uh, research on transdisciplinarity, um, which I just recently discovered. <laughs> They have a lot to offer. I don't know how you, how you are involved in this um, conversation, but I think this is also a field uh, where we can um, learn from and maybe also establish links there. Could, could I say something, uh, being a moderator, but also, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yes, um, I absolutely ag agree, Katarina. And I, I also had this idea when we talked about the tools, making tools, that there's, there is research on methods of tools. Um, and if we make our own tools, we should, of course, reflect on them and, and also Uh, have a kind of monitoring, uh, look at how, how these tools are used, how they have impact, um, and, and have also there this reflexivity uh, uh, you mentioned. I think that is really important and coming from the intangible cultural heritage sector where we really try as, uh, as anthropologists and ethnologists to have impact Uh, maybe we could um, we could also look at at those colleagues who um, who uh, develop tools and who try to influence politics and policy uh, in a way. So also here, kind of interdisciplinary uh, knowledge ex exchange. Um, somebody else. I mean, now that I put something in the chat, I can also say something about it. Sorry for self-promotion. Actually, together with an artist uh, who's also a science communicator, um, Johanna Barnbeck, we developed a game that uh, supports reflexivity in interdisciplinary settings. It's a board game, and basically you get questions on your own discipline. So how do you do science, basically? And uh, yeah, it's great fun. And uh, the, the next game we want to do is a transdisciplinary game. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's as you said, um, Katharina and also Arno to, to, to be aware of that we are so different and then provide a space where we can enter into maybe, yeah, that's what we wanted, playful reflection. Is a, is a really nice thing, I, I guess. And it's also really fun because you learn so much about yourself. I've never reflected so much about how I, myself, how I myself do, how I do science in these interdisciplinary contexts, contexts that can be very frustrating, as we all know. So I wanted to turn it uh, into, a, into a nice thing. And that's uh, the product that we got together, Johanna and I, and just lately we, we, we've launched it. If you want to play it. <laughs> and of course we need, to, yeah, this is really like a tool, but of course it's, it's great to have round tables and spaces where we can have a less hierarchical and more open space of joint reflection. Leah, 
Maria. Yes, thank you. And thank you for all the interesting papers. It's really been a pleasure to hear you. Uh, I have one comment. Uh, it's related to the list of things just uh, that Arnika just presented that were under discussion. I would like to ask, uh, add something. It's sort of uh, a quest question that I'm personally thinking at the moment as I'm getting at set towards the end of my PhD. And it's uh, my question is about uh, how do we pick our sites? How do we choose which case to study? And do we actually, how much do we discuss these kinds of things? And also kind of uh, are all the sites uh, as available in uh, related to producing anthropological knowledge on climate change? I think that was my question. Would anybody like to share experiences about this on this question? Then we we go on with Laura. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think my, my comment is more to what we discussed before um, and not so much to the question that was raised. I, I also think that maybe we should or could talk more about uh, probably hidden interventions or hidden dilemmas of, well, um, well, acting out interventionist practices or whatsoever, or the hinterlands of intervention, because I think what we often do as anthropologists in the field is not probably not enough discussed in the papers that we write because we write about other empirical material and so on and so forth. And there's often not enough space or room on, on the textual level about what happens in the hinterlands of, of our studies. So I think maybe in all so adding more value because it was throughout this day discussed that we only describe and people don't take this for analytical work and so on and so forth. We could probably also use these tools and devices um, by talking about this more and making this also a topic of discussion. So what did we initiate and how can we use this? What happened in, for example, round tables and so on and so forth about um, as, as material as well to, to then analyze um, climate change and practices of adapting or making oneself more resilient or vulnerability making or whatsoever. So I think this should just be made more, more public as well and not only happen in the hinterlands of, of our work. Dominica. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your contribution. And uh, in my opinion, uh, to reinforce uh, the interdisciplinarity, it's also important uh, to, reflect, uh, to reflect on uh, research methodology and also to support the particip participatory approach to the research. This is the first uh, suggestion to the round of table. And the second is that I note that Today there is no uh, ab no <laughs> no about the gender issue, so it's so strange because the climate change it's uh, also and um, it's also very linked to gender issue, gender questions. So I want also to try to insert this uh, topic in uh, our uh, <laughs> adjustment. Thank you. Others. So maybe we are all quite tired after <laughs> after these very fruitful and full uh, panels and the discussion, but I see Zilia. I just wanted to mention, I think we have now three minutes left. So maybe we should just think about how we go on. Absolutely. An extremely nice and uh, also very high level uh, uh, panel. And um, yeah, I, 
I, I just say this now out of the blue. So um, maybe we could offer as conveners that we um, also think about it and get in touch with you. Of course, we are now happy to get your ideas and um, what you wish from us. But um, I'm sure that also Sophie and Domenica and Annika and Michaela and I would be happy to meet each other again. So um, yeah, there can be something after this panel. There should be something. So what do you think might be a good way to continue, so to say? Apart from we could also think about it, of course. Or are there already networks we all have to join? That would also be a possibility. But um, I think we all agree that this was so uh, so wonderful to exchange, to have exchange on um, these topics and on the um, the importance of our our fields. So it would really be great to continue. Any ideas? Do you all agree? <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe uh, this is a little off the cuff now. Um, this is why everyone is so quiet. But maybe you as conveners could schedule a meeting where everyone interested in collaborating can come to and then we can um, see what can come out of it. Yes, do you mean a meeting during the conference, another meeting during the conference or just uh, in a few weeks um, that we send you all a link and invite you to have the other meeting, not now within this week, but we can have a show of hands on that question. So who would, who would like to have a meeting in a few weeks? And who would prefer to have it now? I think it's the most of you who would prefer to... Oh, we have to wait until the, <laughs> the hands go down again, the digital hands. So who would like to have the meeting during the CF conference, which would be in this week, during this week? Okay. So, but still we need so your... There, there are yes. still some proposals concerning a publication of the contributions in the chat. Yes. Could somebody um, of my uh, convener colleagues react on that? No, it's up to you or up to us to react together. And maybe we can meet as organizers after the panel and reflecting an offer yes. for the contributors. Is this fine with you? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Good. Very good. And uh, for all those who would be interested in a, in a meeting in some, uh, some weeks, we only have the email addresses of the contributors. So please uh, put your email address uh, in the chat if you, like, if you would like to be invited and um, then we will definitely contact you. So um, the, the chat will remain open, I think, for, for some more minutes. Please just uh, put your email addresses in. It's now five o'clock uh, Amsterdam time, uh, <laughs> six o'clock Helsinki time, and I don't know uh, how late it is where you are. Um, I want to thank you for a very, very fruitful, um, enjoyable uh a panel um, and I hope to see you again enjoy CF and yeah see you again in, in some weeks hopefully bye bye thanks thank you so much was great should we still stay Sophie yes we stay thank you, okay. you. bye bye thank you bye thank you, thank you for organizing the panel thank bye. you for your contributions
Nomad IT, uh, could you um, save the chat for us? Okay, Nomad IT. Yes, Sonia, could you uh, save it for us and send it to us per email? We can't hear you. I hear you. Sorry. There uh, you yeah, are. It's uh, going to be... Um, um, I'm going to copy copy the chat from Zoom to Wall Wall Chat, so you can either access access it from there, and I can also, um, if you can't access it after this uh, chat, I can uh, inform the um, the organizers that you would like to get the information from the chat if, if that's that works for you or yes yesterday i just got an email from normat it with the chat okay yeah yeah so then, maybe that would be wonderful yeah then then i'm assuming that they're gonna do do it again yes so um shall i put my email in the in the chat for you sonia well if they did it already yesterday i'm going to assume that it's already Or did you ask for it yesterday too? I asked it and I had it within one minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> then, then please put your... Um, uh, yeah, and then I will send it, of course, to the co-conveners. Yeah. And how do we get um, the Zoom films? Sorry? How do we get the Zoom films? Um, they're posted on the CIF uh, website in a few weeks once they've um, edited them and then they're going to they're uploaded they're uploaded on that uh, on CIF's homepage. Okay. And they're gonna stay stay there, so you you should be able to access them from there. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, do you have any other? Uh, ways how I can, or like concerns or anything I can try to help with now. Maybe or Ari Ariane, could you help? I don't know, maybe with the chat? Yeah. Yes, I I'm think not so. Sure. So that we get all the uh, yes. addresses. Yes, of course, that should be no problem. I hope so, <laughs> at least. <laughs> I can. There's not so many. We could even note them down, I guess. If it's yeah. A problem now. Yeah. Um. I will get like a like once I end the session, I do get this kind of small file that has the entire um, Zoom conversation in it, so I, I can just copy paste okay. that. Words. Thank you. In the session first before I can access it. Yes. Um, if there's um, nothing else I can help you with, I'm you kind of not start going. But if you want to stay here, you can still continue talking and discussing things. This. Um, Uh, this uh, chat is like you can stay here for as long as you want. So okay. This, Thank um, you. I'm going to... Uh, Sophie, I'll make you the host so you can just... Bye-bye. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ich habe sie gerade auch nochmal in ein Word-Dokument einfach reinkopiert, diese E-Mails. Ah, ja super. Das war ganz einfach auch. Ja. Ach. Ja, alle ein bisschen klar, aber war großartig. Sorry for speaking German. It was really great. Huh? We're all a little bit tired now, maybe, but uh, really nice people also. Mm. Very good talks. Yeah. So we have a few suggestions now on the table. There's the publication idea and um, then there's 
we offered that we will meet again to maybe do another, to develop other ideas. How do you feel now? <laughs> Exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should, I don't know, maybe also discuss. Yeah, we just have to discuss now how we go on. No? Mm. Not the ideas itself, maybe. I don't know. No. What do you think? Maybe it's better to wait a few days until we have had all these reflection in our heads concerning the different contributions and then meet again via Zoom. Yeah. What do you think about this? Because yeah. we have here um, the top of our teaching semester and um, at the moment I have this feeling of, whew, And in mid of July, everything will be not much, but a little bit better. So maybe we can meet in, at the mid of July and have an exchange. Is, is this fine with you too? Or? Absolutely. I will run away after the semester very soon, to be honest. For so where, where will you, when will you run away? I think my last day is actually already the 9th of July. Yeah, okay. So should we meet before? I think it would maybe be good not to meet yeah. in, in August or something. Yeah. That would be too late, maybe. Must also not be a very long meeting. Maybe mm -hmm. max an hour or something. Mm -hmm. Half an hour, an hour, and then... So, Celia, will you make a proposal concerning the day? Thank you. The eights would be good? For me, it's not good. Sorry, because I am uh, in Naples for a conference. Sorry. Yeah, me too, <laughs> Dominica, me too. I have also a conference eight. On the sevens in the morning? Why not? Uh, I have an appointment there at 10.30, but... Okay. After your appointment? Yeah, so I don't know. How long will it... It will be probably an hour. So Sorry, I have an, a meeting at 11.30, maybe before your meeting even? Yeah, maybe at, I don't know, even 8.30, if that's not too early. Perfect. I, yeah. I, will have, I will have a meeting at 9. Okay, mm. so, so in the so afternoon? So, or in the afternoon. Wednesday, afternoon. 7th in the afternoon? Okay, so um, in the afternoon, but uh, until, uh, sorry, before uh, six, because I have a uh, visit for my mother. Uh, definitely before six. Four o'clock. Four o'clock, mm -hmm. okay. Yes, it's fine. Yes. I have, I have my Vorstandssitzung. I have my colleagues from the institute at, uh, we, we normally stay, start at two. Yeah. And take long. So I will... Should we do 4.30 to be more sure or you start without me if it's... No, 4.30 to 4.30. Yeah, is that okay? Sorry. Yeah. So. I do not know whether Ariane Scheidt has made a lot of notes because some of the speakers were very fast. But yeah. I tried my best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we'll check the notes and send them already to the colleagues. Is this fine with you? Yes. And um, after a while, we will have also the possibility to see this Zoom films. Oh my God! And I'm so sorry for the for that I didn't have the title in my head. <laughs> that was a. <laughs> At the very beginning, you know, I was okay. Something is missing. <laughs> the most. <laughs> I felt quite well prepared, you know, and then I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> But there was an elegant solution done by Sophie. Thank you for helping me out. 
But it's it's nevertheless it's good to have it in the chat because people yeah. might join later and then yeah. they can see in the chat that they yeah. are in the right session. Yeah, so. that was really a good idea. And um yeah, it, it was very, very elegant. Okay. Perfect. Good. So okay. if if you would yeah. like, we can join we can see each other during the journals reception in one hour. Um, but <laughs> I would <also laughs> understand if you have a walk with your beloved ones <laughs> and go 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 walking into the forest or wherever. Thank to you the beach. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also so much for bringing this idea. I think it was Sophie also who brought this idea, no? Everybody contributed in in her way, in a wonderful way. Thank you so much. Great joint teamwork. Yeah. yeah, it's a good team. I really like it. Me too. And I also have the feeling that we, there's way to go and a lot to learn from each other. <laughs> And thank you again to Annika and Michaela who brought up the whole uh, whole idea and and brought us together. Ooh. Yes, unfortunately not with Volkswagen Stiftung. <laughs> yeah, but we could think about it also soon, maybe how to proceed. No, I think what became clear today is that it's an extremely timely and urgent topic. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But I, until now, I do not understand the reaction of Volkswagen because we had different telephone calls and there they had a lot of opportunities to tell that they will change the whole program into demographic changes. But they do something like they have a top secret. They took a top secret and I think that's really problematic. It is. Because you have spent a lot of time in it. Do you have any experiences with Volkswagen? Is this normal that they do not communicate transparent? We had a bigger Volkswagen project in Bremen and I have to say that we were quite happy, but I, I don't know anything about the wider, larger policies about which uh, agendas get funded and so on. You know. Hmm. And who's the one saying, okay, now we will change to this topic? <laughs> well, I really thought that, that we could still connect to this topic in terms of, because also demographic changes are very important for climate change adaptation. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah. yeah. But then it will be different. Yeah, there are other issues then, so to say. I guess we, I'm sure that we could think about how we want to conceptualize it and then look at a, at a funding organization or a program. To do a, a bit larger thing, I think. Yeah. For example, with the great people we met today also. Do you have experiences concerning AU programs? Yeah, we, I was just PI applying in a beautiful transdisciplinary uh, Horizon 2020. Yeah. Green coasts. Yeah. Extremely ambitious and well set up by a um, colleague from the Netherlands. And we were just rejected. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. that's not... That doesn't say anything. No, I know. But I have to say, I'm I'm a bit shying away from the huge commitment. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have we have a uh, a colleague of of mine who does only he, who is uh, employed to in order to write those um, applications. So um, you you as an as a normal team that has also teaching duties and other duties it's nearly impossible to write a successful uh, or not successful application it's really a lot of work also in terms of knowledge and power eh? <laughs> but um, there are of course also smaller programs right and and also more applied programs which might also be interesting we have just had this um, 
this Creative Europe project on intangible cultural heritage and museums. Um, it was more, more a, a networking project, but that was smaller. Also, that EU. sounds good. Um, yeah, we, we have to, to look yeah. once more we carefully. The DFG networking thing, I don't know, but that's quite a German thing. The huh? <laughs> FG is yeah. Deutsch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, we need something European, actually. Also. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful European network now. No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have the appointment July seventh at four thirty, right? Yes. I will send you the Zoom link, and then we will see okay. what we'll decide. Okay. Yes. So you will send the link, uh, Michaela? Great. Yes, I will do so. Very good. Thank you so much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. And Bye. thank you, Ariane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.